Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. I hope you all are well. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala. So like the last video, um, I thought it would be useful here to actually go ahead and just group a few questions together on a singular topic. And uh, this video, I basically put together the questions that I've gotten about the LGBT issue. So LGBT agenda, the LGBT ideology, um, activism, alliances, coalitions, where we stand in regards to you know, young Muslims that are struggling, what we do with colleagues and coworkers. So a lot of questions naturally uh, come in about this and also my own personal stances and my own personal views on some of these things. So I put together about nine of them uh, that have come through inshallah ta'ala and hopefully, you know, even though there'll be short answers, but now you'll find some benefit in it. So the first one is actually directed towards me. Do you support the LGBT agenda? Wallahu la ilaha illahu. I do not. So that means I don't religiously, socially, politically. And I do believe it's important for us collectively as a community to actually oppose any agenda or ideology that is contrary to the Quran and the Sunnah. So that's my personal view. And that is, of course, I think the view of um, the imams uh, all around North America and any Muslim that's committed to the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay, so question number two. Can I support LGBT rights politically, even though I disagree with it morally? And the answer is absolutely not. Look, I've written about this in an article in 2020 on Yaqeen, and I've spoken about this in multiple podcasts and multiple articles. And I want to be very clear here that Muslims should not be asked to, nor should Muslims participate in anything that undermines their deen. So you cannot be asked to separate between your religious conscience and your political and your moral principles. And so that means if you're a Muslim politician, an activist, if you're even just a lay person, do not find yourself promoting anything that directly contradicts the deen, that directly is advocating for essentially a prohibition from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any legislation that supports a supposed right to do something that is directly prohibited in the deen is not something that you can get involved in and it's something that we should abstain from altogether as Muslims. Question number three, can we as Muslims form an alliance with LGBT groups because they support our rights as Muslims? And the answer to that once again is of course not. How can we find from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, any justification for allying with a group that exists on the basis of a cause that is in direct contradiction to his message. So we have to, as Muslims, operate on the basis of principles, not some sort of political tribalism. It's not you scratch my back and I scratch yours. It's we have certain causes, we have certain issues, we have our own principles that we operate with, and that's the basis that we're going to engage society with. Now, a good follow-up question to this would be, and it's not actually asked here, but I'm adding it because I think it's important what about a group that's not actually an LGBT group, but it's an anti-war coalition or it's an anti-poverty group, and they happen to have in their overall agenda items that we don't agree with? And this is really where it depends, and it requires a little bit more scrutiny. And generally speaking, most people have operated with this idea that what matters is what's on the banner, not who's on the stage. And I agree with that for the most part, but if we're learning from our past mistakes, actually, if I'm learning from my past mistakes specifically as well, sometimes the baggage of the speakers can overwhelm the actual agenda item that has supposedly brought us all together. And that could be for a number of reasons, right? That person's personality is well known for those other elements. It could be what they're wearing. It could be something they slip into their speeches. And so you have to really be careful to try to get everyone on the same page in advance and say, look, we're here for a very specific agenda item. And this broad coalition is here for poverty. This broad coalition is here because we're against the war in Iraq or whatever it may be, right? And I actually want to give an example here because subhanAllah, it's very immediate and it's near and dear to my heart. It's a cause that um, I've been a part of for, for years now in some capacity. And that's the case of Dr. Afia Siddiqui, whose sister, Dr. Fauzia, was just here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free Dr. Afia and allow her to go back home and be with her family. Look, her case is not a popular case. It's not a case where it's easy to get people involved. So what happens when you have human rights organizations or civil liberties organizations that are willing to take on her case, 
I think it would be wrong for us to say to them, we don't want your support because we went on your website and you got these other things that you also do. I think we would welcome their support. But we say in advance, look, we're here for Dr. Afia specifically. We're trying to free Dr. Afia. And so any forum that we have, any protest that we have, any type of activism we do around Dr. Afia has to be about Dr. Afia. And we don't want anyone to bring any other elements into these protests or into these forums that contradict the specific cause that has brought us together. So making sure in advance, as much as you can, this is going to be about the cause and absolutely nothing else. And we do not welcome anything that undermines what we stand for and what we foundationally are as Muslims in the pursuit of justice for this particular cause. All right, the fifth question here. Have you ever attended an LGBT pride parade? So first of all, absolutely not. I have never attended a pride parade and inshallah ta'ala, I never will. And if I do, you should condemn me. So this is not something that I stand for. And I do believe as a Muslim that to celebrate what is prohibited is prohibited in and of itself. And so no imam, no student of knowledge, no one who upholds the sanctity of the tradition would celebrate something that is prohibited. And on top of that, no politician, no activist, no athlete, no one should find themselves in this position. And I would advise everyone who has done so to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to not do so again, because this is dangerous territory and you risk compromising your akhirah over something that is so cheap. So absolutely not. And there's a picture here um, of me holding a sign that says love knows no borders and so a lesson in the internet this was even sent to me by a family member in the Arab world uh, with the caption Al-hub laysa lahu hudud, that love knows no borders this was a migrant protest at the border of the United States and Mexico so love knows no borders literally meant that the people that we were looking at at the other side of the border that were being mistreated behind the fence are not to be hated or repulsed. Love knows no borders, literally the United States and Mexico. And so, no, don't take any imagery or any videos to suggest otherwise. I have never attended a pride rally, alhamdulillah, and I never will, inshallah. All right, the next question, and this one is personal, and um, I appreciate the question. <laughs> Do you regret any of your activism from your younger years? So first of all, I appreciate the question. I'm not that old, alhamdulillah. But since you say younger years, um, let me actually pull further into a time that I remember with my activism that is really before much of these things that have transpired today. I can remember prior to, I want to say 2014, 2013, that a single issue protest, a single issue cause was truly a single issue cause or a single issue protest. I grew up with parents, may Allah subhanahu wa have mercy on my mother and may Allah preserve my father, who were deeply vested in refugee crisis, deeply vested in pro-Palestinian activism, deeply vested in condemning racism. I mean, all types of things, anti-war activism. And so I remember going to multiple protests and never seeing things get diluted the way that they have been in recent years. And honestly, you know, subhanAllah, I, I think that there was a switch, and this is probably obviously subsequent to the political climate in the United States changing, where protests 2015, 2016 onwards really started to follow suit with political tribalism, identity politics, where multiple issues in the name of intersectionality would take over the stage where the protest would suddenly have banners and suddenly have signs that had nothing to do with the cause and that made everyone uncomfortable but it was like hey you know here it is like muslim ban the airport protests what do you do when people show up in a matter of a few hours and everyone's got their signs and everyone's got their own chance everyone's got their own things going on so it's in those years that subhanallah i think that those changes really started to become apparent to me and in my mind, it was always like, I'm there for the cause. If I'm engaging Muslims who I feel like have gone a little bit too far, advise them, give them nasiha, try to steer them back to the Quran and Sunnah, keep reading the Quran, speaking about the hadith, bringing in the issues that are dear to us as Muslims. 
But at the same time, I actually really do regret a lot of what happened, especially between probably the years 2016 to 2019. And that's where I think that I really had to take a step back and reassess my own activism, my own participation in these things. And so I look back at uh, an example now, which is once again, the migrant protests. And subhanAllah, the treatment of people at the border is horrendous. And it's been that way under Democratic and Republican administrations. And I got exposed to it for the first time, in fact, in that time period. That's the first time I actually went and saw for myself. And it was after seeing Syrian refugee camps. And I've spoken about this. To see the way that people are in poverty and mistreated in these privatized warehouses uh, was really heartbreaking and devastating. So I'm going to Tijuana, I'm going to Juarez, I'm going to the border over and over and over again. And the amount of protests were numerous. And I didn't do a good job of actually asking questions before these protests. It was like, I know why I'm here. I know what I'm going to say. I know when I'm going to show up. And things just kept on happening that I wish did not happen in those protests. And so I go back and I look at it. And I specifically remember um, one protest at the border of San Diego and Tijuana. We had numerous Muslims that went out there and it was organized by the Quakers, right? And if you read about the history of the Quakers, you'll kind of understand where that's coming from. And it had a large coalition, but it really took a lot of strange turns. And subhanAllah, there were things that were just happening right and left. And it was like, what's happening here, you know? So you had anoint, anointments. And for me, I was like, I've never seen an anointment at a protest before, right? So I step aside and I move away. I should have actually intervened. So even doing nasiha afterwards, um, I wish I would have intervened in, intervened in the moment. And there are things that ha continue to happen. So there's the pouring out of the water. Now, in my mind, pouring out of the water we're on the side of the US border. We're looking across this humongous fence and we see poor people on the other side and pouring out the water on this side, in my mind was that they have a right to be here. And that was the understanding that I had when I was doing that. Now, granted that things get really tricky with, with vigils and with the types of practices that have um, their origins in different thoughts and practices in these places, I should have done a better job. And when it was brought to my attention and when, you know, obviously there was a lot that happened after that, Allah knows that I sincerely repented and I ask Allah's forgiveness for that. And not only that, but honestly, taking a step back and saying, I'm really going to ask questions, a lot of questions before I go to any one of these spaces, any one of these forums. And inshallah ta'ala, keep myself away from these types of things. And sometimes, you know, these things happen with snap judgment, and that doesn't justify them. That just means that I've got to look back and learn from my past mistakes. So 2016, the Pulse nightclub shooting, the LGBTQ nightclub shooting, we're talking 2016, a very different climate. This is on the heels of San Bernardino, where attacks against Muslims are crazy. And then we had an element of hope when Muhammad Ali Rahimullah passed away in his janazah sort of brought another breath of fresh air for Islam in America. And then suddenly the worst mass shooting in America is committed by a guy who's supposedly a Muslim going into an LGBT nightclub and mowing down 50 people. And we panicked. And subhanAllah, I remember, you know, getting the call, driving to the place. I didn't even know where the press conference was going to be held. I literally just plugged it into my GPS. I got there and they said, well, you should read the statement. And we would frequently gather after a mass shooting because, um, you know, we obviously don't want this to result in backlash against the Muslim community. And I was there to condemn violence. And I still condemn violence and con condemn vigilantism. That was an awful thing that happened. But I got there. They said, we've got a statement on behalf of all the faith leaders. We want you to read the statement. I look back at that and I wish, first of all, as a Muslim community, we didn't accept the premise of that so quickly, right? And I think that's the spirit in which a lot of the posts and the Orlando statement, so many things came out. I also wish personally I would have handled that differently. Now, I don't think it's fair that that is clipped and used to suggest that I participated in a pride rally today, right? Or that it was something that it's not. But at the same time, 
I should have been more judicious about my words. I should have been more careful. And I ask Allah's forgiveness. So what I do now is, you know, 2019 to 2023, we're at, we're at right now. Alhamdulillah, I've had a chance to really step away. And who I am now is very different. And what I participate in now is very, very different. And I can actually look back, and I did actually look back in my calendar to see what I've participated in since 2019, since the end of 2019. Uh, two protests for Palestine, one for India, one for, well, multiple for Afia Siddiqui, and then one for Imam Jamil Amin. And so for me, it's like, if I don't know the space, I don't want to be there. I can still advocate for the cause and still deeply care about it. But I ask Allah's forgiveness for that. And inshallah ta'ala, I hope that uh, I can still find ways and we can find ways as a community to still be committed to causes that are important to us without undermining ourselves by inculcating elements intentionally or unintentionally that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right. Jazakumullah khaira. Um, everyone, inshallah ta'ala, I'll just knock out a few more um, in regards to this particular subject. So the next question is, why did Yaqeen publish a paper by Dr. Jonathan Brown regarding LGBT? Now, first of all, the context of this, for those that are not aware, um, this is referring to 2017. Yaqeen is about a year old at the time, and we published a co-authored paper by Dr. Jonathan Brown and Dr. Shadi al-Masri that was specifically around how the Muslim community should deal with the potential legalization of same-sex marriage at the time and what the implications would be for Muslims trying to live by their religious laws in a secular society. So to walk back a bit, and it's not on the website now because it was removed about two years ago, um, but to walk back a bit, inshallah, to, to the context at the time, there were debates at that time in a very different socio-political climate about what was going to happen to us and where Muslims should really stand politically on the subject. And a lot of that had to do with the overall just left and right bias and whether Muslims should ally with the left or ally with the right. But a lot of it was really about the specific issue. Okay, do we as Muslims have a greater ability to function in accordance with our deen when the government is more hands-off of our family affairs, of marriage, of contract law and things of that sort? Or are we as Muslims to advocate for laws that would be closer to what our religion is? Or do we as Muslims stay silent on the issue altogether and just pick other issues to politically organize around? So this paper comes out of a debate that was happening in multiple places at the time in the Muslim community. Dr. Jonathan Brown publishes his opinion, which was an opinion that was shared by many others at the time, that it's actually better for Muslims if the government has less overreach, less oversight when it comes to family law and things of that sort. And he published this on Lampost, I believe, in 2015. He published this with Al Medina Institute, Iman Wire, in 2016. And there was a debate that takes place at EMJA, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, in 2016, where you had scholars that were debating the merits of the argument, right? So Yaqeen is a one-year-old organization. At that time, we're publishing papers in different formats. Uh, we really viewed ourselves as a new platform, and we're trying to give a platform to arguments and debates that are happening in the community. The only difference between what Yaqeen did and what other platforms and organizations had done at the time is that we actually published his argument with a rebuttal side by side. So Dr. Brown's argument with Dr. Shadi al-Masri, which Dr. Brown welcomed at the time, by the way, uh, and still uh, does welcome. And basically the paper was laid out in the following way. Number one, you know, a complete acknowledgement that this is all haram in Islam, that Islam has no room for same-sex actions and that we cannot dilute our theological understanding in this political debate. Then he goes on to make his arguments about, you know, sort of accepting more hands-off approach from the U.S. government regarding marriage and other uh, family affairs and contractual affairs, because that would be more conducive to our community being able to live in accordance with its beliefs and uh, with its ways. Now, Dr. Shadi al-Masri 
provides a rebuttal in the same paper, side by side, where he says that this is a bad idea. You can't ask Muslims to separate the religious from the political. This will lead to confusion in the Muslim community. And this has some potentially detrimental consequences that maybe are not being uh, looked at carefully enough by those that are making this argument. Dr. Brown at the time actually wrote that I agreed with him, with Dr. Shadi. So that I and multiple people, and in fact, most people at Yaqeen, uh, thought that there was a problem with Dr. Brown's argument, as well as the other scholars that were making that argument at the time. Now, fast forward you know, to 2021, uh, we did actually decide to take down that paper because of the potential confusion that could come out of it, a very different socio-political climate. And we put an explanation there and a redirect to a much more detailed paper, which I'd encourage you all to go read, inshallah ta'ala, Islam and the LGBT question, reframing the narrative by Dr. Carl Sharif at Tuggi. It's a 50 page paper uh, that is based on a complete reframing of the narrative, which is what we really need at this point, because this narrative has become so pervasive in every single element of our politics, of our social spaces, of our media, of our cartoons, of our school system, that it's important for us to actually go deeper than simply making a political argument either way. And um, alhamdulillah, uh, Dr. Sharif's paper, um, or the paper that's based on his work has now been turned into curriculum at Yaqeen, and Dr. Sharif is teaching at Sapiens, inshallah ta'ala, a free course of over 30 hours, uh, really going deep into the narrative. And this is the type of work that we need right now as a Muslim community. And this is the type of work that you're going to see at Yaqeen, inshallah ta'ala, of really looking at how, ethically speaking, we make sure that we establish our foundations properly in our deen, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, and work with other institutions, work with other imams, work with other um, you know, uh, organizations that advance a normative position in Islam as to how we can make sure that our youth not just reject this politically, but are fully certain in the Islamic framework of this particular issue and any other ethical issues. All right, so the next question here is, how should we treat Muslims that struggle with their desires and their Islam? And I want to actually acknowledge for a moment here that subhanAllah, the amount of emails that have come through of young Muslims, especially young Muslims that are struggling with this. And the amount of young Muslims that will walk up to myself and other Imams and say that I'm struggling. I'm trying to be the best Muslim I possibly can. Uh, what do I do? That that number is growing and that none of what I have said should be interpreted as opposition to you or as hatred of you or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates you in fact, you identify as a Muslim. And it's important for us to acknowledge for a moment, inshallah ta'ala, that all of us identify as Muslims, people that submit themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in pursuit of his pleasure, in pursuit of his paradise. And it's very beautiful here that we don't identify by a claim to perfection or being you know, uh, at any particular level with our faith, nor do we identify by shortcomings or sins or feelings, no matter how you know, long those feelings have persisted or how strong those feelings are, how temporary they may be. We don't identify by feelings. We don't identify by anything but Islam, that we are people who seek Allah's pleasure and we strive for him. And if you are struggling and striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only should you not look at yourself as a person who is a failure in life. You should look at yourself as someone who has the potential to be a close friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions subulana, that those who strive in our way, we're going to guide them to our paths. Allah mentions that those who restrain themselves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jannah is their abode. Paradise is their abode. Paradise is their refuge. And so none of this, none of the opposition to the movement, to the agenda, to what's happening in schools right now, to the political movement should be deemed in any way as hatred of you or suggesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates you, O oh, sincere, struggling, striving young Muslim. And to everyone else, you know, I just want to reiterate this again. 
Do not let your opposition to the movement lead you to beat up on young, sincere, struggling, striving Muslims. All right, the next question, and I'll probably make this the last question, inshallah ta'ala, and sort of this set of questions is, well, how do I deal with my coworkers? How do I deal with my colleagues that identify as LGBT? What do I do in these situations? And I want to say, especially to the young Muslims here, and in fact, all Muslims, carry yourself with both courtesy and courage. We are a people, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, who have the best of character with everyone we interact with. We call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We show people what it's like to live by the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We remain unambiguous in our principles. And so that means sometimes uncomfortable conversations because we live with calling to Allah and doing amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar, right? And joining good and forbidding evil. But at the same time, let your Islam shine ta'ala through your character. Show courtesy, show genuine care for everyone ta'ala, that you interact with. And that is a part of our deen. And it doesn't change with anyone that we interact with. Ta'ala. So inshallah ta'ala with that, I'm going to close it out. And I wanted to just kind of have a take home message. Number one, uh, on an individual level, Jazakumullah khair unto all of you who have sincerely corrected me and um, sent me concern. And I hope inshallah ta'ala that uh, some of this is helpful. And I pray Allah Azza wa Jal protect me and protect all of you from being amongst those who are described as akhadatul izzatu bil ifm, that ego stops them from repentance. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all of us turn back to Him and that He accept our repentance with the ta'ala and that He allow us to be used for good, that he rectify us and rectify through us, that he guide us and guide through us. Allahumma ameen. The next thing I want to say is, I hope inshallah ta'ala that as a community, we have the ability to take advantage of this opportunity in front of us inshallah ta'ala to really put forth an alternative way. What do I mean by that? And I gave a khutbah about this, that, you know, there are more people that have embraced Islam in the last year than I've ever seen before. People are looking for something else. People are looking for meaning. And there's nothing more meaningful than that which is anchored in Tawheed. There's nothing more meaningful than this deen, which is for the concern of all people in regards to their dunya and their akhirah, in regards to their lives and their afterlives. And we really need to usher forth that way of Islam together ta'ala, that speaks to the concerns of people in a morally consistent way that is away from the hypocrisies of the political left and the political right, that is away from cruelty, that is away from moral degradation, that is away from political polarization, that doesn't get hijacked by any of these political parties or platforms. It's important for us to have our clear and pristine way and to call people to that together. And this is another note, which I hope is a good sign that, you know, in this last year, I've seen more people become Muslim than ever before. I've also seen, alhamdulillah, more walls come down between scholars and students of knowledge and organizational heads to start thinking about how we come together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learn from our past mistakes and chart forth the best future. So don't let the toxicity or uh, sometimes the insults that get thrown around on social media and different places deter you and not see the blessing and the beauty of people that are coming together to usher forth a better way and the shaitan hates nothing more than our unity inshallah ta'ala when we're unified and working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so may Allah azza wa jalla unite our hearts may he unite our ranks may he use us for good and may he forgive us for our shortcomings and may he make us amongst those that he is pleased with Allahumma ameen jazakumullah khairan I appreciate you all sticking with me for uh, the much longer uh, AMA than usual, and I don't plan to do this uh, frequently, but I hope it was beneficial. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.